This is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. The ginger prince and his stupid wife literally are beyond exhausting. But it's important we make sure that they're kept in check so they don't get away with pulling a fast one on the public. This video is an update to yesterday's video that I did talking about Prince Harry winning the right to appeal for getting his taxpayer-funded security back. In this video, I question the legitimacy of this announcement because there was no documentation or evidence surrounding it. So rightfully so, I was skeptical. But today, the UK court database had updated and published this order. So here is the order, and yes, it is true that Lord Justice Bean did approve Harry's request for appealing his court case. Let's go through what this justice had to say. I'll be honest with you, the UK court system and the way that everything is organized and how things are referenced is incredibly frustrating. Initially, when I read this, it felt like I was reading Chinese, but I spent the whole morning trying to get this sorted and figured out. So let's go through it and let's talk about what is really happening and what this all means. So at a high level, right off the bat, for starters, the media did not paint a full picture here. Are we surprised? No. But what actually happened here is that Harry filed a couple of appeals based on parts of this court case that he lost, and not everyone was granted. In fact, it says here the decision, permission to appeal granted on ground one and the second part of ground two, analogous position. Then number two, it says permission to appeal refused on the first part of ground two, irrationality, and on grounds three, four, and five. So if you know nothing about this case, then none of this will make sense to you. But I ask you to stay with me because I will be going through that so it becomes a bit more clear and understandable as to what the heck is this guy talking about? Now, the third point that's made here in this decision, application for expedition, refuse, is the easiest to understand. So we'll cover that first and put that aside. So what the judge is essentially saying here in his reasoning, as to expedition, I refuse the application made by Shillings in their letter April 30th, 2024, for an order that the appeal is to be expedited and heard by the end of July. It is rightly not suggested that the claimant, Prince Harry, is entitled to jump the queue because of his status. Well, I hope not. Two reasons are relied on. Firstly, the fact that we are now approaching three years from the issue of the claim. That is correct. But I note that the claim was not issued until more than 18 months after the Raybeck decision of February 28, 2020. Secondly, it is said that the claimant's legal team will be engaged in a long matter from October 2024. Neither of these justify the order which shillings seek, which, you know what, you can't fault them for trying. But at the same time, it's like, that's not the court's issue. If you have a resource and bandwidth problem, hire more people. All right, now that we've gotten this over with, let's go back up and tackle the meat of this. Number one in the decision, permission to appeal granted on ground one and the second part of ground two, analogous position. Now, let me pause. The one caveat that I want to put here is that I'm not sure if the grounds that are listed here, grounds one, two, three, four, and five, are the same grounds that were listed originally from when Harry submitted his case in the first place. With that being said, I am going to use the arguments that were being put forward because it is consistent all the way up until now. So, you know, if there is some type of misunderstanding, please give me some grace here because I'm not a lawyer. I'm just doing my best to interpret this and understand exactly what is going on. Okay, getting back to where I was. In order to understand this, we have to take a step back to understand what is the actual goal that Harry's trying to do. Let's go back to July of 2022, where the judgment came down for Prince Harry to ask for permission to apply for judicial review of decisions concerning the arrangements to be made for police-provided, publicly funded, personal protective security, aka protective security, for him when he is in Great Britain. The decisions that are challenged were made by the Executive Committee for the Protection of Royalty and Public Figures. The committee is commonly referred to as RAVEC. So in July of 2022, Mr. Justice Swift went ahead and granted Harry's team to go ahead and apply for this judicial review. 
And if you recall at the time when this judgment came down, those stupid squatties were like making it sound like Harry won. Harry won nothing. Now, keep in mind, visibility in the UK court system is a frustrating thing. So what we see is a very lopsided conversation going on here. So with these judgments and orders that come down, it's based off of materials that the claimant or Prince Harry had submitted. So when we see something like this, they will recap or give a summary of the information that they had received in their hands. And after the summary, then they give their justification for why they're granting or denying whatever the request is. So in this case, He did give permission for them to go ahead and submit all the paperwork now for being considered for a judicial review. It almost seems like they could have taken a step out. So in this quest to get permission in order to be able to apply for this judicial review, Prince Harry's team set out five grounds in which they feel should be granted it. And what we see here is the explanation of ground one, ground two, ground three, ground four, and ground five as this case builds. So this was the conclusion that they came to on what they could focus on in submitting their materials for this judicial review. As you can see, ground two, three, four, and five had been granted, but then it also says at the bottom here, save as aforesaid, permission to apply for judicial review is refused. So what are they talking about? That would be ground number one. As you can see here at the bottom, it clearly states that the permission has been denied. It is now between July 2022 and February 28, 2024, that the legal teams behind the scenes have been submitting information and, you know, getting their application ready for this request for a judicial review. During this window of time, after the materials had been submitted, Justice Lane had to review it and make sense of it. And what we saw in the February 28, 2024 judgment in the 51-page document on whether or not this was going to move forward to the judicial review so Harry can get his security back. So this judge wasn't buying the arguments or grounds that Prince Harry had set forth for grounds two, three, four, and five. Remember, number one was dismissed in the pre-stage. So at the end of this 51-page document in the judgment, it says, none of these submissions necessitates any substantive elaboration of the findings made above. On the contrary, they are further examples of the overarching problem with the claimant's case, Prince Harry's case. Namely, his inappropriate formalist interpretation of the RAVEC process, paragraph 201 above. The decision of February 28, 2020 was obviously forward-looking in nature, which was the point being made by the defendant in paragraph 162. The in and out submission is dealt with paragraph 178 above. The suggestion that the claimant, Prince Harry, should have received both an RMB analysis and a bespoke approach ignores the witness evidence of the defendant, which, for the reasons I have given, falls to be given weight. As already explained, that evidence shows no irrationality or other unlawfulness as regards the other VIP category. And as you can see, the decision here is, for these reasons, the application for judicial review is refused. So he got the approval to go ahead and apply. And then once he applied, he got knocked down. So in essence, he didn't make it into the ring. And this is what the main point of the appeal is for. It's to get into the ring to have this judicial review. So we're going to come back to looking at ground one in a second. But let's go back to the order that came down from Lord Justice Bean, in which, number one, it says permission to appeal granted on ground one and the second part of ground two. Reasons, number one, although the carefully reasoned judgment of Sir Peter Lane may prove to be correct in all aspects, I am persuaded, not without hesitation, that an appeal on ground one would have a real prospect of success. So now this is important to understand. He references the judgment of Sir Peter Lane, which you're seeing right here. This is the cost order that was given to Prince Harry, directing him to pay 90% of the costs that the defendant incurred in this process for the application of this judicial review. And being that Prince Harry was denied this judicial review, 
Harry was on the hook for paying whatever costs the defendant incurred for entertaining this bullshit. Now, once again, this is a lopsided conversation. We're only seeing what the judge puts forward in summary based off of the communications that had been going on behind the scenes. And here, now from what I gather from this document, there was a lot of pushback behind the scenes from Harry's team. Sir Peter Lane outlines the costs associated with the reasoning behind why these grounds that were presented did not hold any weight. Firmly emphasizing, despite all these excuses, Harry lost. Now back to the order. Keep in mind, everything that was being looked at at this point was around grounds two, three, four, and five. Remember, ground one was dismissed at the very beginning when they asked for permission to apply for this judicial review back in July of 2022. So before we talk about ground one, let's take a look at what grounds two, three, four, and five were. Keep in mind the grounds were the arguments that Harry was putting forward as to why he should be given this judicial review. So in a nutshell, at a high level, the arguments that Harry was putting forward for ground two, he was really honing on the fact that Ravak wasn't being forward thinking and God forbid if something happened to him, like an attack, the backlash that the UK would feel for not giving him security considering what his mother had gone through. Pity play. He was also saying that the decision to pull his security was irrational because of not having this forward thinking and impact because he's such a public figure and humanitarian. Ground three was all about focusing on something and it was redacted. I am filling in thinking that it had something to do with mental health. And he's saying that a lot of the decision that was made was based off of this particular aspect and claiming that the RAVAC policies were not being applied properly. Then for ground four, he's saying that there was a lack of transparency. He wasn't given any kind of details of how the RAVAC policy works and operates. And then ground five was he thinks that he was being treated unfairly and being denied the opportunity to make informed representations. And we'll get into a little bit more about this in a second. If you want to read it for yourself, please go ahead and pause the screen now. Otherwise, I will continue on. So now let's go back to ground one in focusing on why it is now coming back into focus and is the pillar for this appeal. The argument here is focused on the RAVEC policy and the opinion that it was applied in an overly rigid and inflexible manner, contesting that the way that it was applied was wrong in law because Harry is sixth in line to the throne. And there are some particulars around the law here that they were trying to make. However, the justice shut it down by pushing back and saying, he did not accept the argument that was being put forward in accordance with the law. And a little bit down towards the middle of the paragraph, it says the 2013 Act self-evidently contains no provision that, whether expressly or by necessary implication, impinges on RAVAC's activities. In approaching its own task of deciding which persons in what circumstances can be provided with protective security, RAVAC was subject to the usual public law standards entitled to decide for itself which persons within the line of succession to the crown should fall within what I have termed category one. There is no arguable case that RAVAC was required to regard the class of persons described at section three of the 2013 Act as a relevant consideration. Well, that was then and this is now, and this appeal now seems to be falling on the shoulders of a technicality, which strictly focuses on the RAVAC policy itself in accordance with the law and how it is applied. So when you look at reason number one and Lord Bean's justification, even though there is some hesitation, he does see that there is a possibility for a case to be made. And that's because in the cost order that was issued by Sir Peter Lane, it was argued by Harry that he wasn't aware of a policy change with RAVEC. This is the technicality that they are driving on now that the 2008 terms of reference were no longer in force. 
nor did Harry know the content of the 2017 and 2021 terms of reference. So apparently, it was not until December 2022 that Harry learned about these 2017 terms of reference, the evaluation criteria, and the existence of the other VIP category, something that he was not aware of at the time in 2020. So now when you look at this technicality and you see reason number two in which it says, A, the first sentence of ground two argues that the judge should have found that Ravex decision, that its terms of reference did not apply to the claimant because he was outside the Ravex cohort was irrational. I agree with the defendant that this argument is premised on the success of ground one. If ground one succeeds, this point adds nothing. If ground one fails, then this point cannot succeed. B, the second sentence of ground two is perhaps a slightly different way of putting ground one, but for the avoidance of doubt, I grant permission on that point. And this is what he's referencing. As you can see, 143 Harry's saying that by failing to treat him as falling within the the Rayback cohort and therefore not following the process in the relevant terms of reference, meaning that the application of the current policy was not followed, then he does have a ground to stand on in order to get this judicial review. I mean, it's a technicality, folks. So now looking at numbers two and three, they're essentially contingent on ground one succeeding. In trying to process and decipher this judge's order, it does appear that the grounds or arguments that were submitted in for this appeal do appear more or less the same as what was submitted the first time around. A little bit cleaner, but definitely incorporating ground number one, which is this technicality of Harry not knowing about the updated terms of reference policy. I would be curious to know if he could regurgitate or explain what the 2008 Terms of Reference policy is. I also would like to know how big of a difference between the updated version and the old version to understand if this really is a sticking point. I hate the thought that this little technicality could actually help him move and grant this judicial review. Because theoretically, in all fairness, if let's say there were updated terms to this reference policy and they were not applied according to the new reference policy, then that could be seen as him not being treated fairly. And that's all that is being asked here, which I know that there's an ulterior motive, is to get in front of this judicial review and unload a whole bunch of lies. But, you know, right now where we're at, if he can prove that he was treated unfairly and he was not given the proper respect as other candidates that are going through this, I don't know how often this happens, then he does make a good argument. But we'll just have to see. Here, the judge sees it. And in some respects, even though it is a technicality, he does see that there is a potential for success. I mean, he's hesitant, but he does see that there could be success here, depending on how the legal team positions their narrative. So where do we stand on this? Well, I think the next steps now is for Harry's team to submit the actual appeal, focusing on ground one and ground two and making the case there. And I'm sure it'll be months that will go by. And behind the scenes, the justice will be reviewing all the information and then we'll come forward with another judgment, summarizing what was being discussed behind the scenes and then coming to a decision whether to grant this to go to judicial review or kill it dead in the water, which I hope is the latter. But we'll just have to see. I know this is exhausting, but hopefully this was valuable and you understand what really happened here. I think Harry has a shot, but it's a long shot. He's got a lot of work to do here in order to make his case to win this back. He's not as close as people think he is. He still has a way to go. So anything can happen. And it's kind of funny that they wanted to hurry this along and get this completed in July. I wonder why. Anyhow, definitely let me know your thoughts. As always, I will be back with more content, but until then, please be safe and I'll talk to you later. Bye. I was such a broad. <laughs>